Kalela wrote her first song when she was 26. She released her first body of work when she was 30. To get to where she is today, Kalela has been on a long journey that's been defined by self-doubt, pessimism, but also an undying confidence that music is the only life for her. An artist that is defiant in their stance not to sell themselves out for anyone or anything that doesn't stand for who she is. This is the story of Kalela. Born as Kalela Meisene Christos on June 6, 1983 at George Washington University Hospital, Kalela had the spirit of progress and determination embedded into her mind before she was even born. Her parents are Ethiopian immigrants who came to the US in the 1970s on full college scholarships under an affirmative action initiative that funded the education of African students. As her parents met through a radical student movement that was interested in reform, the young Kalela inherited this passion for change, often asking herself, how did white people take over the world? I could not get off of this question. It consumed me. It was, for Western standards, an unorthodox upbringing as her mother and father, who never married, lived in the same flat but in different apartments. Although she was born in the northwest quadrant of Washington, Kalela moved from her childhood apartment to a new home in Gatorsburg, Maryland, when she was only a toddler because her mother insisted on getting as close as she could to the white suburbs. The whiter you go, the better the school. As the daughter of Ethiopian parents, an American and a black girl who had friends of many races, Kalela's natural inclination to act as a bridge between between different people, cultures, and genres started when she was only a child. What made it worse was that Kalela's school was extremely segregated by race and class. I've always wanted to be the liaison, the one to make difference more acceptable for people and to illuminate the beauty I see on each side to the other. Kalela's father was one of the most important figures in our musical, artistic, and moral evolution and would often take her out on trips to the local theatre to watch South African plays during the height of anti-apartheid mobilization in the United States. I remember my dad actually when I was took me to see Serafina, an opera musical at the Kennedy Center, and I remember not understanding everything but hearing the music and associating it with the freedom movement. This is something that happened to people and this is how they got free. Even though the specific genre would change frequently as she got older, one thing that has always been a constant in Kalela's life is her passion and involvement in music. While her parents lived in different apartments but in the same building, she would get two different musical educations. At her mum's place, she would sift through soul and jazz records by artists like Miriam Makeba, Sarah Vaughan and Bobby Womack. At her dad, she fell in love with Tracy Chapman's self-titled debut album at the tender age of five. Being an only child, she would spend a lot of her time with her cousin. Whenever her dad drove her over, she would play Tracy Chapman's self-titled and would belt out all the songs. The album's cover, Chapman with her hair short and her eyes on the floor, made a big impression on Kalela too. The album cover fucked me up. After getting images of every other black woman thrown at you, pop stars like Whitney Houston and Janet Jackson, you get this. I looked at it forever while listening to the album, continuously trying to wrap my brain around this woman. Her father said there was an intensity to the way she listened. She was indiscriminate in the way she would sing in different languages and she had the capacity to memorize songs after just one or two listens. But the young Kalela was also a self concessed pop and R&B fan and would spend many hours listening to Whitney, Janet Jackson and Aaliyah records, all while leaping onto tables, belting to an imaginary stadium filled with adoring fans. As a child, Kalela enrolled in her school's choir, something she thoroughly enjoyed and would later realize she inherited her voice from her mum, who always led songs at weddings and family gatherings. Even though she spent most of her time mimicking what she learned from VHS copies of The Sound of Music and Rhythm Nation era Janet Jackson music videos, her parents decided to enroll Kalela at the age of eight for violin classes, which she didn't really show much interest in as she knew her heart truly belonged with popular music. Popular music was this abstraction, an abstraction that was relating to immensely but was ultimately far away. However, just before she turned 12 in 1995, Kalela got her first chance to get up close and personal with popular music when she called in with a friend to a radio Radio show where she managed to win tickets to a concert. The lineup being TLC, Boyz II Men. That was the year of Boyz II Men too, as well. Um, D'Angelo when he first came out. It was crazy. I can't remember all the people, but I just remember being overload. In the same year, she also bought her first tape, a remix tape of Biggie and Faith Evans' Give Me One More Chance. Faith Evans being an artist that Kalela was particularly enraptured with as a kid because of her amazing jazz-inspired voice. When Kalela reached middle school, she started to feel the alienation caused by her skin colour even more. It's a feeling that was crystallised on her first day of middle school, where it seemed like everybody got a memo that said you're supposed to sit with your race. After spending her childhood going around to everyone's lunch table with her best friend, it was a pretty big shock. In the end, Kalela and her friend made their own table where other people would come to visit them, and then they would hop around the lunch room when they were done with their lunch. There are certain events in the teenage life of Kalela Maizanekristos that would be very crucial in her early apprehension of pursuing a music career. 
career. The first happened when she was 13 years old in 8th grade and had just completed a successful voice, violin and dance audition for DC's prestigious Duke Ellington School of the Arts. Kalayla was ecstatic at the thought of thriving with other talented black youth and the opportunity to finally pursue her musical dreams. However, her parents couldn't afford the out-of-district tuition so she couldn't go. Kalayla was crushed. The disappointment she felt from missing the boat at Duke Ellington was something that would trickle over in her 20s. For years, she thought it was too late to become a star. However, it didn't mean she completely stopped making music of any kind and when she was around 13 years old, she went through a short-lived punk phase where she pretended to get into Green Day so she could fit in with her white guy friends. She even had a pink electric guitar but the phase didn't last long. As a teenager, Kalela communicated her resistance to being boxed into a singular narrative through her style. She'd merch trendy urban denim brands like Parasuko jeans with a pair of skater-friendly vans to make it tricky for her classmates to pinpoint where she was situated class-wise. Just feeling very avant-garde for wearing vans with Parasukos. I was made fun of because it wasn't making sense. It wasn't computing. She could always be found singing and chatting at choir and was even voted most likely to be a pop star in her end of year yearbook. During this developmental time, Kalela got into electronic music thanks to random Napster downloads. I was thinking myself as a part of it, non-verbally agreeing with myself that one day I would be inside of that world. It was also through Napster that Kalela first got into grime music, a genre that would eventually be incredibly influential on her music, specifically her influences of rhythm and grind, a mid 2000s UK movement where rumbling synth and bass subs met the lilt of a female R&B vocalist. However, even though she still held secret hopes of future music stardom, when she graduated from Magruder High School in 2001, she decided to enroll at Montgomery College in DC, for what degree it's not clear. While at Montgomery College, she'd get a shot of inspiration every now and then when her classmate, local rapper and producer Odyssey, would play beats for her in his car. However, the inspiration was only temporary as Kalela still didn't feel persuaded to get involved in music again. For reasons again unclear, Kalela decided to leave Montgomery after a year for a degree in International Studies and Sociology at the American University in DC. Even though she would later come to hate her degree and her time at school, Kalela did enroll initially because she felt it was important. Every time I experienced racism, and sexism, the intersection of both, or misogynoir, it's almost like I go back to the drawing board. Why am I still so busted up by this shit? I feel so crushed and hurt every time. While she was at university, her boyfriend at the time introduced her to experimental jazz and encouraged her to pursue her singing career. Kalela recalls, it was really hard for me to be like, I'm going to be a singer. I was depressed for a long time because I thought it was too late. There are so many prodigious people appearing out of nowhere. It causes this sense of urgency because you fear that you're behind. I was very passionate about singing, but I had no formal training. All of my singing was shower singing and sing-alongs. It's so important for people to know that nobody necessarily knows what they're doing. In 2004, Kalela made a very important trip from DC to New York to visit an artist that would later become one of her greatest inspirations, Amel LaRue. While watching the performance, she would hold a voice recorder under the table, record the live show, then study the recording in the car on the way back to DC. Amel LaRue was immensely influential on Kalela because of her mix of jazz and R&B, two genres we have already mentioned that are strong points of reference for Kalela. In her words, her approach to making songs was all I really cared about at that time. I could sing them and feel her power in pretty overt ways. Her shows were beautiful experiences and every person that I ever took to see her would be in tears at some point. She brings it so hard. From that point onwards, Kalela decided that she would try singing at least once in her life, saying that seeing Amel LaRue live was a trigger for her wanting to become a singer. Feeling apprehensive at first but determined to give it a go, Kalela first challenged herself to sing songs in Arabic and Urdu to stretch her vocal abilities. Then she started to perform jazz standards during open mics at local cafes around DC, slowly regaining confidence in her abilities, but more importantly, confidence that being an artist was the only life possible for her future. However, she eventually fell out of the jazz scene because she wanted to focus more on writing her own music rather than singing other people's songs. The turning point came when Kalela started failing at school and her parents confronted her about her grades. She replied, I need to not do this. I think I'm really distracted. I think I'm subconsciously really overwhelmed with the fact that I haven't pursued music. So with only a semester left of school and still not having written one original song at the age of 25, Kalela decided to drop out of university and pursue her music career. At first, she got into a creative rut and wasn't able to start on any new music. It wasn't until a meeting in 2008 that Kalela would gain the advice that would lead to her writing her first original song. Kalela discovered the music of Little Dragon, a Swedish band on MySpace, and was immediately blown away. She contacted the lead vocalist, Yukumi Nagano, on MySpace, offering background vocals, whatever she needed. The two eventually connected at a Little Dragon show, but Yukumi was surprised to learn that Kalela didn't have any of her own music on her MySpace. At the time, Kalela still hadn't really made the jump from 
from imitator to songwriter and Yukimi offered some advice. I would just recommend jamming with your friends and not having expectations of how it's going to sound. Inspired, Kalela wrote her first ever song within a couple of months. Following her breakthrough, she joined the indie band Dizzy Spells and soon after met her boyfriend who helped her to start writing more songs. Kalela, however, found her real creative freedom when she learned how to record on her laptop. It gave her something she always wanted, the freedom to make mistakes. That's literally when I started writing my own music. Being able to pursue it and mess up, I couldn't get it with other people like that. However, the indie scene in 2009 DC was, in Kalela's words, so stifling because it was so white. And she started to feel that same feeling of otherness and alienation that she felt as a child. Around this time, Kalela started to rip instrumentals from artists on MySpace because she knew she wanted to experiment with a more electronic sound than the one she had with her band. She would download an instrumental, record a verse over it, and then send the finished product back to the producer in hopes for a collaboration, though she didn't get many. In 2009, Kalela had another breakthrough when she attended an experiential workshop called The Flow. In a room of 40 strangers, she practiced a series of trust exercises that were meant to completely shed her personality and allow her to start anew. In that moment, I literally decided because I wanted to be a musician so bad, I knew I had to abandon any personality that I think I am or I think I'm not. More determined than ever, Kalela moved from DC to LA in autumn 2010. No plan, not a lot of money, she just had to make it work. Kalela has said, if I had stayed on the East Coast any longer, I imagine the best case scenario being a future where I would have a frustrating day-to-day -day life and ultimately be the kind of overbearing stage mom trying to live vicariously through my children. She knew she had to get out. First, she connected with the electronic duo Teen Girl Fantasy, which is an interesting name, and then contributed to their album Tracer on the song FX. The collab it led to a meeting between Kalela and Prince William. No, not that one. This one. The one who owns the label Fade to Mine. Prince introduced Kalela to his label's signature sound and the producers behind it, and she was blown away. She immediately started working with the producers on the label, trying to create a sound that lined up with the label's own traditions, but also felt true to her artistry. In November 2012, another miracle came when Kalela rear-ended someone's car and totaled her own. Hang on, it's better than it sounds. Her car was impounded, license suspended due to an unpaid parking ticket, but when she got in touch with her insurance company, she found herself $5,000 richer. Kalela took the cash, quit her job as a telemarketer, and started her life as a fresh musician. She eventually made her label debut with the single Bankhead with Fate of Mind's Kingdom in August 2013. A couple months later, wanting to create a mixtape that sounded like a remix collection, Kalela released Cut For Me, her debut mixtape produced by Kingdom and other Fate of Mind producers, Bok Bok, Girl Unit, Jam City, and I can't pronounce that. The mixtape immediately made a name for Kalela in the indie music scene as her release coincided with the whole wave of alternative R&B that was taking over the indie scene back in 2013. It received universal praise from critics, saying that it pushed R&B to its limits by injecting it with UK bass, grime, and techno. After releasing an array of tracks in 2014 with the musicians of the Warp label in the UK, she eventually joined the experimental Warp roster, which included artists such as Aphex Twin and Flying Lotus, while her first release was the six-track EP, Hallucinogen. The EP was described in an article as being about the beginning, middle, and end of a relationship in reverse chronological order, with the EP starting out sad and cold and then slowly making its way towards the beginning of a relationship. Hallucinogen received universal praise from critics, receiving a score of 8.3 from Pitchfork. I think the most special part of this EP is her work with Arca, who she met on a boat in New York in 2012. They instantly had the connection and spent the next three days talking about their artistic visions and making music, out of which one song, a message, was eventually used in the Hallucinogen EP. Kalela finally released her debut album, Take Me Apart, in October 2017. She has explained that the album expresses an honest vision of how we navigate dissolving ties with each other and yet remains sanguine for the next chance at love. Despite it being a personal record, the politics of my identity informs how it sounds and how I choose to articulate my vulnerability and strength. I'm a black woman, a second generation Ethiopian American who grew up in the burbs listening to R&B, jazz and Bior. All of it comes out in one way or another. She worked with her usual group of producers, including Fade to Mind's Bok Bok and Jam City, Arca and Ariel Rekshai. The album received a score of 84 out of 100 on Metacritic, was included in the 2018 edition of 1001 Albums You Must Hear Before You Die, and was described by one critic as a towering achievement of an album. To end off, here is a quote from a 2013 Pitchfork interview with Kalela. I've always wanted to interrupt the space. More than sounding like anything, my commitment has just been to fuck it up. Let me know in the comments how much you already knew of Kalela's story, and if you learned anything new, how does it change the way you see her as an artist? And before I go, I'd really appreciate it if you could subscribe to my channel and like the video. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.